Now, I would like to introduce Michael A. Vogelbaum. He is the Associate Director of the Rose Ella Burkhout Brain Tumor and Neuro-Oncology Center, Director of VTNC Center for Translational Therapeutics at the Cleveland Clinic, and Associate Professor of Surgery at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. Wow. Okay. Um, a New Jersey native, Dr. Vogelbaum, also holds that Robert W. and Catherine B. Lamborn Chair for Neuro-Oncology. He is board certified in neurological surgery. In addition to his active neurosurgery and radioactive practice, Dr. Vogelbaum has been primary investigator of numerous local and national clinical trials of new drugs and surgical techniques for brain tumors, and he has an active translational research program. He has also externally funded basic science and translational research laboratory, which focuses on various aspects of drug delivery to brain tumors. He is currently developing novel devices for delivering therapeutics directly to the brain. He is very active in the Society for Neuro-Oncology. He is also on the educational board for the journals Neuro-Oncology and Neurosurgery. Please welcome Dr. Vogelbaum. Well, it really is a pleasure to be here, um, and I'd like to thank Al and Stan. Uh, I, I realize this is going to be a, a tough act to follow after hearing uh, those stories, uh, but hopefully I can talk about what's going on and where the hope is uh, for, for actually developing and finding real cures uh, for brain tumors. Um, as was mentioned, I'm, I'm actually from here. Uh, when, when Al called me uh, about this, uh, I jumped at the opportunity to come home, and of course, uh, stayed, stayed with my family last night, and, and it, you know, there was the trip down memory lane, and so this had to be inserted uh, in the talk, and that is back when I, too, had more hair. Uh, so so uh, it's, it's, it's been a while. This is the team I'm with now. Uh, and uh, actually, this is a bit of an outdated photo. We're, we're a bit bigger than this now. Uh, ours is a very large multidisciplinary group focused on treating patients with brain tumors. That's, that's all I do in my neurosurgery practice. Uh, and, um, and we actually have five neurosurgeons who only treat uh, uh, people with brain tumors and neuro-oncologists, medical oncologists, and a very large team that helps support this whole operation, including uh, our own uh, patient support group uh, headed by Kathleen Lupica. And, and, and uh, the role of, of having a nurse uh, doing that is, is just so, so incredible, so valuable. Uh, and, uh, uh, but we have a large team, including a large research operation. I'm going to talk about uh, quite a bit of that uh, today. And uh, here's our approach, and that is, that is uh, the team approach. So uh, as you all know, I don't, I don't, you know, this is a slide that I, I use for, for my scientific talks, but this is one that you all understand very well, uh, that it's still a difficult disease, just as it was decades ago. Uh, and here, you know, the standard treatments are the same, surgery, radiation therapy, uh, and then chemotherapy, uh, and, uh, and, and that's where we stand today. Um, surgery, of course, we're, we're trying to remove as much of the bulk tumor as possible, um, and, uh, and, and of course, to get the diagnosis and grade, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, uh, but the chemotherapy story is, is, is not a very, very good one. It's, it's very few active agents, uh, and, uh, and it's been very frustrating for us as well. Of course, we have very specialized techniques that allow us to do these things. And uh, uh, Al warned me that I should not have graphic images, so, so prepare yourself. Uh, here's what surgery looks like. Um, actually, I think, I think we, we've developed some more refined techniques at the clinic. We, we use anesthesia. You can see uh, being held, held here, there's, there's the anesthesia. Uh, we, we do, in fact, wear these hats, by the way, when we're operating. <laughs> So, but the conventional treatments that I, I talked about are, are rarely curative uh, for patients with malignant brain tumors. Um, we do feel good about what we're doing because we do improve survival to some degree. We do improve quality of life for most patients. But really, we, we go into this hoping to, to have cures uh, and to develop cures. And that's ultimately what the goal is. So why, why has it been so hard? 
Why has this disease been so resistant to treatment? We've heard about all the advances in lung cancer and breast cancer and, and, and stomach cancer and, and, and colon cancer. Why, why not brain tumors? Um, it's, it's a very difficult disease for, for many reasons um, uh, that, that are beyond just the inherent resistance of the tumor cells to therapy. Uh, it is an infiltrative disease. It spreads throughout the brain. It doesn't just grow as a ball. And that's why surgery alone is not enough. Um, the, the cytotoxic chemotherapies uh, have shown limited benefit, and that's partly because they don't get to the brain very well. The brain has evolved very, very effective mechanisms to keep potential poisons out of it. And, and let's, let's, you know, face the truth, the chemotherapies we use are poisons. They're, they're, they're poisons that are used in a way that, that try to preserve the normal cells and affect the tumor cells the most, and that's true for any cancer. Uh, but, but these don't get into the brain very effectively, uh, and so that's one reason why it's been so hard uh, to treat. And, and just to illustrate that, this is, this is an example that I use uh, for clinicians as well, because not all clinicians tr uh, fully understand this issue. In the upper panel here uh, is what's called a T1-weighted uh, enhanced scan of the brain, and here is the bulk tumor, okay? But down here is what's called a flare scan, and this one shows the infiltrative component that's beyond the bulk tumor that I've outlined. This is what we remove with surgery. This is the problem out here. That's what needs to be treated with chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and so on. And in fact, if you, if you uh, um, do biopsies, you can show that there are tumor cells spread all throughout that, that area that's beyond the, the bulk tumor. So really, uh, a lot of what we are focused on is to try to figure out better ways of treating the infiltrative tumor, which, by the way, doesn't show up on the enhanced images. People talk about the blood-brain barrier being open where you have enhancement. That's not completely true, but it's also not the issue. The issue is treating the disease that is non-enhancing, that's behind a normal blood-brain barrier. So I'm going to talk about some of the new approaches. I, I would, it would take me hours to talk about everything that's going on, uh, and there is a lot going on. Uh, but I'm just going to focus on a few new things that are, that are going on, that, 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 and, and I'm going to focus on the surgical aspects uh, of these new therapies as opposed to some of the medical therapies, which we also work on. But we'll, we'll talk about the surgically delivered therapies uh, today. So where do cures come from? <coughs> Ultimately, they come from clinical trials, or that's, that's, that's how we figure out whether or not they're, they're effective. And there is no therapy and no device that can be proven to be safe and effective without evaluation in patients in a carefully uh, uh, designed and executed clinical trial. And so anything else you hear about outside of that um, may provide hope, but it is not ever known whether or not it's effective unless it's done in a clinical trial. And these are of mutual benefit to, to patients and, and the sponsors uh, because these things cannot be approved uh, by the FDA without a, a good clinical trial or several trials. Uh, and this gives patients access uh, to potentially more effective new therapies. But only 5% of patients end up going on to clinical trials, and that's, that's a problem. Uh, so are we making progress? Well, let me talk about some of the things that I think are contributing uh, in, in terms of new, new uh, devices and new, new therapies. Um, and uh, so I'm going to talk about a, a new technology that may allow patients to receive the benefit of surgery when they, when they can't um, uh, undergo surgery because of safety reasons, and that's the Autolit. I'll talk about that. Um, and then ultimately, uh, something that I think will help improve delivery of drugs to the brain be, uh, behind the blood-brain barrier, uh, and that's convection-enhanced delivery. I'm going to talk about a, a new type of gene therapy, which is the TOCA 511, uh, and then new technology, which uses um, uh, localized magnetic fields, uh, something that's actually not fully understood how it works, and I'll, I'll talk about that as well, which are the tumor treating fields. So we'll start with Autolit. There's a company, uh, th this is not the only, uh, so LIT, L-I-T-T, -T, stands for Laser Interstitial Thermal Therapy. Th this is not the only device for that. There are some others, uh, but the one I'm going to talk about is the one that's developed by Monteris, uh, and th our program is being led by, by one of my colleagues, Gene Barnett. Uh, so the background, heat kills cells, okay? Uh, our bodies have, have carefully controlled temperature uh, because uh, uh, 
too much, too much heat is bad for cells. That's why fevers can be, can be deadly. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, and it's a well understood relationship between temperature and amount of damage. It's a linear relationship in a sense. Uh, so between certain temperatures, and these are in uh, centigrade, so, so of course um, uh, 37 degrees is, is normal. So, so once you get up to 43 to 55, you start, the, the cells start dying by several mechanisms. And then above that, you get coagulation um, and charring. Uh, but you can actually, if you can control the, the temperature very, very uh, carefully, uh, you can get selective killing of tumor cells. At least that's, that's the theory here. But how do you control it carefully when you're, when you're applying heat to a localized area? Well, you need to be able to image it. And there's a technique uh, that's based upon MRI, uh, which is called thermometry, MR thermometry, where you can actually calculate, directly measure temperature inside the body in a localized area. And this is just a, a, an MRI of a, a very arthritic knee uh, showing that. Uh, so this, this autolit, uh, uses a laser uh, that is directed through a, a small uh, catheter uh, and it actually is side firing which has some advantages in terms of localization uh, and uh, then it actually has active cooling to re reduce the chance of charring. Uh, and this, this video gives you an idea of the approach. So you have a tumor that's deeply seated uh, this probe is placed into the tumor and then the side firing laser starts to elevate the uh, temperature within the target. Uh, and, um, and you can monitor this in real time. Uh, you then turn the uh, probe and you can go uh, um, treat another uh, aspect of the tumor, another portion of the tumor. Turn it again and uh, treat another portion of it. And this is done stepwise um, over a quite lengthy procedure. Uh, uh, this, this takes hours, uh, and uh, uh, so you treat one area and then you can pull the probe back and see that moment there. Uh, you can pull the probe back and start treating another area and uh, continue all the way through again. This is being done in real time with uh, MR thermometry allowing you to monitor this uh, uh, as the, as the uh, treatment is uh, continuing. And I will show you some of that in just a moment here. So this shows you MR thermometry as it can be monitored. Actually this is the early days with low resolution MRI and I'll show you a higher resolution picture in a moment. On the left what you see is the laser firing and you can see the temperature change as the laser fires. And on the right, you can just see the, the change in a slice uh, over time. So um, the way that we, we use this, remember we're, we're changing the temperature in the tissue, and as you increase the temperature, uh, you increase the chances uh, that there's going to be damage to, to what you're targeting. And there's a, a very quantitative way of doing this so that you, you, can, you can define lines, zones, where the risk of injury is higher or lower, and that's what these white, blue, and yellow lines are, is, is the uh, uh, prediction of how much damage is being done. Uh, and so you can actually see this in the brain, and it's going to be, takes a few minutes here, but you, this, is, this is the real time. You'll see changes in the color, particularly uh, on the, on the uh, right here. Uh, where you start seeing a little more red color in the area that's being treated, and now you start developing uh, one of those, those treatment lines, giving an idea of prediction of where, where uh, damage is going to be. And so you can shape this uh, as it works. So this is treatment in a single slice, and you can monitor this as you're going and, and, uh, and start with a plan and then match the plan. And it's almost like doing radio surgery uh, in a sense. So that's the idea behind it. Um, it's a very new technology, so, so it was first studied using a clinical trial. Uh, and this first in man study was, was really just looking at what are the, the doses of heat, in this case, that are safe. And can we do this safely? That was, that was the goal of the first trial. And that study was done at the, at the Cleveland Clinic 
and at our uh, partner and competitor across the street, University Hospitals. Uh, and it was a, a trial that was led by, by Jean Barnett. Uh, and, um, uh, and the primary endpoint was, was literally clinical toxicity to see whether or not this was a safe uh, procedure. Uh, 11 patients were enrolled uh, and 10 patients treated. And all the uh, treated pa patients had treatment necrosis, that is tumor death, tumor tissue death was observed at the time of treatment. Uh, and um, I'll show you an example here. So this is, this is pre and post imaging uh, of a patient uh, so that the top panels are before treatment and what's outlined here is, was, was the target for the treatment, what, what we wanted to treat. <clears throat> and then at the bottom, you can see there's a change in how much it's enhancing, how much it lights up immediately after treatment. This is 24 hours later. How about over time? Here's what it looked like 24 hours later. Here's what this area looked like 180 days later. Okay, so, so it's a great example of, of how this technology uh, could work. Um, it's important to understand whenever you're thinking about, whenever someone shows a nice picture like that, whenever you hear about a phase one trial and the results, we, we can always show at least one example of something that looked great and promising. The question is, you know, does this work for everybody and who does it really work for? Uh, and um, so that's still being determined. But based upon that first experience, the device was cleared by the FDA. Um, there are a number of centers around the country now uh, that are, um, are installing or have been using uh, this technology, either in the form of Autolit or uh, another one called Visual Lace. Uh, and um, we've actually now, uh, in, in the original days when this was first set up, uh, you, you would have to install the, the probe in the operating room and then transfer, transport the patient over to the MRI, uh, which could be a ways away, and then have them down there and then take them back after hours of this to the OR to, to pull the device out. We've now uh, developed one of the first integrated autolit uh, um, intraoperative MRI ORs. So we have a, an OR that has an MRI in it, and we've now integrated the, the uh, autolit into that. So we don't have to, to move the patients at all. Um, and uh, the treatment of recurrent malignant tumors is, is the primary indication. That's what the FDA said it's cleared for. Uh, but it looks like it may have utility for some other uh, indications as well. This is a developing experience. And there's potential for other things uh, down the road. This is a very, very new technology. Um, and it's created a lot of excitement for us in terms of, of a, a new tool that may be very useful for, for, for treating disease that has been um, uh, essentially untreatable uh, in the past. I'm going to switch gears now and talk about um, uh, something that is, that is uh, very near and dear to my heart in terms of developing technology, which is this idea of convection enhanced delivery. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, drugs don't get into the brain very well. And, and uh, we, we need to be able to treat a large region of the brain where these tumor cells are essentially hiding. Uh, and so this is a technology which I think may help with that. So, so the, the understanding that drugs don't get in very well has been, has been out there for, for, again, decades. And there have been many strategies to try to improve delivery of potential therapies to the brain, including manipulating the drugs so they may get in. We know some drugs get in, uh, but trying to manipulate these drugs. Uh, trying to take advantage of specific transport mechanisms. Some things are actually actively brought into the brain and trying to take advantage of that, hijack that, that method. How about breaking down the blood-brain barrier? That's been a very active area of research. We have run a number of clinical trials there. And then there's the idea of direct brain delivery, putting it directly into the brain itself. And there are a number of methods for that. <coughs> Many of you have probably heard of the, excuse me, the biodegradable wafers, the gliadel wafers. That's one approach. <clears throat> There's been um, uh, attempts to try to uh, put drugs into a uh, rese resection cavity or put it into the spinal fluid, put them into the spinal fluid. Uh, but these all have limitations in terms of how far the drugs really penetrate into the brain tissue itself. Convection enhanced delivery delivers it directly into the brain uh, tissue itself. So the idea behind it is a drug is slowly infused into the brain tissue. For many years, it was thought you couldn't do this. You couldn't pump something in. Neurosurgeons 
were always worried about getting fluid out because we, we were always concerned about brains under pressure and we want to get fluid out. We wouldn't ever think of putting fluid in. But Ed Oldfield at uh, the NIH uh, recognized that if you did it slowly enough, you could, actually, um, you could actually pump drug in without increasing the pressure in the head. Uh, and he showed that um, back in the early 90s. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot of advantages, potential advantages to this. And this, this is a schematic that gives an idea of the problem. <clears throat> so the schematic shows the, uh, the, the uh, a, a, a image of the brain uh, after a tumor resection. And the little red cells, uh, the little red spots actually are, uh, give an idea, a representation of tumor cells. So when you put in wafers, you can see that you get a very high concentration of drug right on the surface, but not much beyond that. Uh, same with just a quick injection, same problem. W but with convection, you can infuse a much larger area with, with a much more uniform concentration of drug. And, and, uh, and I always say schematics, you know, it's, it's easy to draw pictures. What about actually showing it happening? We actually have evidence of that. But first, I'm going to talk about what can be delivered. And there's a v wide variety of different types of drugs that we could deliver directly into the brain, including the conventional chemotherapies, ones that you are, have heard about. Uh, and then there's some novel drugs that may be targeted therapies, and those can be delivered. Uh, viruses, and I'm going to talk about one of them a little bit later. Uh, and then uh, specific proteins that are engineered to, to attack tumor cells. And that's where most of the experience has been, has been with these targeted toxins. And I'm not going to go into details here, except to say that a lot of work has been done. We've learned a lot, but we've also learned about some of the limitations. So here's an example showing that you can actually pump drug into the brain. So these are images taken at different time points. And uh, this black line you see here is actually the catheter that was placed into the brain. Uh, the patient had a resection of the bulk tumor down here. <clears throat> and so this was to treat this area uh, adjacent to the resection cavity. Uh, and um, uh, John Sampson, a colleague of mine down at Duke, had, had uh, given a, 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 an experimental drug along with uh, a form of a protein that had a tag on it, had a radio label, so it would show up on a scan, on, a, on what's called a spec scan. And, and so you're seeing where that radio label went, and it's nicely penetrating into the brain in a large area. So it looks like it works. However, there are problems. The problems are that when you try to, to um, introduce fluid into the brain through a small tube, it's sort of like the blowing up a balloon problem. When you start to blow up a balloon, initially there's a lot of resistance. And if you don't have a good seal, air just goes around the outside. Uh, once you get the balloon started, then it's much easier to do that. And the same problem with putting a tube in the brain and trying to pump drug in, there's initially resistance to that. And if there's not a good seal around the catheter, the, the, the fluid you're introducing in just goes right back around the catheter and never gets into the brain parenchyma. Here's an example of that. Now you can see that radio labeled drug is sitting up on the surface. Not much of it is in the brain itself. And so that is undesirable. And unfortunately, that's what happened most of the time with the kind of catheters that were used. There was no catheter. There was no technology designed specifically to do CED. And so we were using just off the shelf catheters, things that we usually would use to take fluid out. We were, we were pumping in through those. And, and that's all we had available to, to do this. So the few cases in which a tracer was used showed that the, these catheters we were using were ineffective. And, and so uh, that was a problem. We tried to get around these problems uh, through a number of different approaches. Uh, and, um, and, and, and ultimately, uh, a phase three study was done uh, with one of the experimental drugs using just these off-the-shelf catheters. And unfortunately, uh, well, here, here's, the, here's what the trial looked like. It was, uh, a randomized trial, so, so um, two-thirds of the patients had this new uh, 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 drug given via catheters, uh, and one-third of them had a conventional resection in gliadel wafers. <clears throat> and ultimately, there was no difference here. Okay, These, this is a survival curve showing that over time, okay, time going out here in weeks, this is the percentage of patients that were still alive. Okay, and you can see between the red line, which was the experimental drug in the gliadel, there was no difference. Okay, 
Now, um, I'm not going to go. I'm, I'm not going to go into statistics here. I'm not going to talk about that because because uh, that would put me to sleep. But the the, uh, the the problem here was that this this trial was designed in a way that it was supposed to show superiority, and it didn't, and so it failed to show anything. And 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 when we went back and when we looked carefully at what happened, we didn't have tracers. We didn't have a lot of things in this trial to really understand what was going on, but through a lot of um, further investigation and indirect uh, um, uh, information that we had, it seemed that we, we, the, the drug was not really getting in effectively, and that's, that's why that was a problem. So where are we going? Well, we knew the drug could not be predicted. Where it was going could not be predicted, measured, monitored in that trial. Um, and because of some of the steps we had to do to reduce the risk of backflow around the catheters and all, we probably weren't treating the area we needed to treat most. We just couldn't do it with the technology in hand. So now what we're doing is, um, since then, we've learned it is safe to actually infuse gadolinium with whatever drug you want to do. And here is an example of that. This is actually uh, that white you see here is being infused, has been infused into the brain stem. Uh, this is actually a primate, but um, this, is, this is in the brain stem and showed no side effects, no problems. And in fact, it's been done in patients, uh, many patients now, including pediatric patients. So we can actually infuse a tracer along with our therapeutic drug and see where it went and guide, guide the treatment. But as I mentioned, we've been using just off-the-shelf technology, things, things that were not designed for this purpose. And so there have been a number of uh, attempts to try to design better catheters to do this. Uh, one approach has been to create what's called a step-down catheter. The smaller the end of the catheter, the less the chance uh, for backflow. And so we're doing, uh, that, that was one approach, and you can see actually in a gel model with the step-down uh, that it seemed to infuse better than one that was done uh, without the step-down. Um, here are some examples of, uh, of, of, um, of gadolinium being infused into the brain stem uh, of a, of a, a primate uh, using that step-down approach and, and the fact that there was really no backflow around the catheter. Um, these are actually, um, uh, th there, there are a number of groups now that are actually uh, veterinarians who are treating dogs that develop gliomas. There are a number of breeds that are prone to developing uh, um, uh, brain tumors. They're, they're the brachycephalic dogs, the boxers and, and the like, that, that uh, the short-nosed um, dogs tend to develop brain tumors. Uh, and, uh, and so now veterinarians are treating these um, uh, under experimental protocols uh, using convection-enhanced delivery and can show very effective infusion uh, into the, into the uh, tumor. But there is a size problem here. So when you use this small step-down catheter, uh, here's, here's the brain of a mouse, here's a rat, here's a dog, here's a human. When you start using a small, small catheter to try to infuse, how do you get that large area that we need to treat? And so one of the things that we've been doing in Cleveland is to develop uh, new types of catheters with multiple ports that can treat large areas uh, of the brain. And uh, in the upper panel here, you can just see one of our early prototypes that only had two microcatheters, but here's the infusion in gel, in a gel model of the brain, uh, showing very nice infusions, and this is actually uh, infusion in a pig, uh, in, in the deep brain of a pig. Uh, and uh, we're, we're, these were hand-built prototypes that we created uh, at, the, at the clinic. Uh, we're now working with a manufacturing partner and uh, hoping to get these into a clinical trial early next year. Um, so in summary, the failure of drugs to get into the brain is over, often overlooked uh, by both industry and, and uh, clinicians. Uh, and CED is still a work in progress, but, but it's an area that I think holds a lot of hope. Uh, for, for being able to deliver our therapeutics much more effectively. So now I'm going to talk about one of the thera therapeutics that we're actually very interested in and one that may uh, be, be ideal for, for uh, CED, and that's this uh, uh, TOCA 511, uh, and uh, um, Tocogen is the company. So gene therapy for cancer has been um, out there for a long time as, as a promising therapeutic. Uh, and there have been, there's been a lot of work with gene therapy, not only for cancer, but for other diseases. 
Um, many of the study that have, studies performed in brain cancer have been using what are called non-replicating uh, vectors or viruses. So, so when you pass a cold from one person to another, that's, that's because it's, it's, it's a, a, a virus that, that replicates it. It, it. it makes copies of itself that are then released and spread. Um, and that, that uh, uh, property of viruses to reproduce themselves uh, has been genetically taken away, by genetic engineering, taken away from many therapeutic viruses because of safety concerns. Uh, and, and you can imagine you, you don't want your, your therapeutic virus to spread all throughout the body. You want it to just go where, where you deliver it. And that, so the first generation of these viruses were non-replicating. And so they were just used to, to, because they would be able to get into cells. Viruses can get into cells. So they were just used as a, as a, a delivery mechanism. Uh, and, and that approach was found to be safe, but it was not terribly effective uh, because they really wouldn't spread. Uh, and, uh, and, and so the lack of efficacy was attributed to the inability to infect all of the tumor cells. We're now several generations past that and using replicating viruses that are engineered in a way to, to try to prevent them from getting into normal cells and designed in a way to try to prevent them from getting normal cells, but can spread throughout tumor. And, and TOCA 511 is one of those. So, so here is sort of what we consider to be landmark work in brain tumor uh, virus uh, strategies. So this was, this was uh, work done by uh, Fred Lang uh, at MD Anderson. Uh, where he injected one of those non-replicating viruses into a tumor uh, and then went back a week later and removed the tumor and looked to see where the virus went to see if it was spreading throughout the tumor. And so all of this is tumor tissue here, around here, and here is the extent of the virus spread. So all this tumor here had no virus within it, did not have the therapeutic gene this area did. That's, that's, that's great that he was able to deliver it there, but it's not going to be very effective, is it? And, and so, but this was an important first step to be able to get to where we are now. The tocogen uses a different type of virus that does uh, replicate um, and, and infects proliferating cells only, cells that are actively dividing. What are the most actively dividing cells in the brain? Tumor cells. Otherwise, the brain doesn't have met very many actively dividing cells. Um, also, it doesn't kill cells on infection. So the, the, the first replicating viruses, called oncolytic viruses, were ones that would reproduce so much that they would burst the cell. So they would infect a cancer cell, reproduce, reproduce, burst the cell, and then that was it. The factory was shut down. Okay? The, the idea of these viruses is to turn the cells into a factory to produce more viruses. You destroy the factory, it's not going to be terribly effective. And, and what would happen is, the, for a number of different reasons, there wouldn't be spread through the tumor. With this virus, it does not shut the factory down. It doesn't kill the cells. It, they, they keep producing virus and keep producing, keep producing, until you shut the factory down. And I'll talk about how that's done. Uh, also, this is a type of virus that's not normally seen uh, by, by uh, humans, uh, and so there's less likely to be an inherent immune response against it. Uh, and so, so the potential is, is for more long-term uh, control. But it's still early stage, and I'll, I'll talk about the trials. Here is an experimental model of brain cancer uh, showing a tumor next to brain, within the brain. And here's where the tumor has been uh, infected with this virus carrying a marker gene so you can see uh, where the virus went. And there's really none of that in the brain. Uh, so um, I realize there's a lot on the slide. Let me just tell you, it, it's delivering a gene. Ultimately, we want the virus to deliver a gene that is not present in normal cells. We call this a suicide gene. Okay? It's not quite a suicide, suicide gene because there's two steps to the process. It delivers a gene that's not normally present that will convert a non-toxic medication into a toxic one for the cells that are infected with the virus, the ones that are producing this gene. The gene is called a cytosine deaminase. It converts a drug called 5-FC, which really has very little in the way of side effects, into a drug called 5-FU, which is a very, very potent chemotherapy. So potent that it can't really be given in high doses to get into the brain. 
It's too, too, too much toxicity. So here, what, what's, what the idea is to turn the tumor cells into a factory that produce the enzyme that will convert a non-toxic drug into a toxic drug within those cells. And uh, this just schematically shows what happens. We inject uh, uh, the tumor, the, the virus, at least theoretically, spreads within the tumor. We then give the 5-FC, and hopefully the tumor regresses. Um, this just shows some animal data. and get, we've, we've cured lots of mice uh, in the lab. Here's another example of curing mice uh, with, with this approach. So um, we're now engaged in the first in man study uh, of, this, of this virus. And you can imagine this took years of work with the FDA to get it to a point where, where it was considered to be acceptable to move forward with this trial. And I can tell you it took at least six months, if not nine months, just to get it through our uh, biosafety committee at, at the clinic. It's, it's, it's uh, a lot of work to get this up and running. And I understand it's gonna be um, uh, up and running here uh, in the near future. Um, so these are adult patients who have recurrent high-grade tumors, grade three or grade four. Uh, and right now the tumor size is being restricted because uh, uh, we need to um, give the virus the best chance to spread to get a sense of whether or not this is actually working. Um, at some point in the future, perhaps uh, larger tumors will be included. Uh, and this cross-sectional area is, is roughly around a three centimeter tumor or smaller, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and, uh, and then um, the usual sorts of things for going to a clinical trial, you can't, cannot be completely immunocompromised. Um, and if acid is not precluded, it just it has to be out of, out of the system in six weeks because it needs to be fully out of the system for surgery safety reasons, because this does involve a surgical procedure. And the surgical procedure is that we inject the virus into the tumor. So we do a biopsy and at the same time inject the virus in. Now, um, for the first pass at this, we're just using the biopsy needle to inject the virus. That is not an ideal approach. Uh, we actually do want to spread it out uh, more completely within the tumor, which is one reason why, why uh, Tokogen is very interested in the CED story as well. So after this has been injected, we wait four weeks. Nothing's going on. No treatment. It's letting the virus spread through the tumor, which is, again, one of the reasons why we start with smaller tumors, because nothing is being done in the way of chemotherapy or anything else at that time. Ideally, at that point, the tumor is spread throughout I mean, the, the virus is spread throughout the tumor, and, it, and so at four weeks later, we start giving the 5-FC. And this is pills that are taken uh, for six days. Uh, and then four weeks later, you take those pills again for six days. And this just keeps going on uh, until there's evidence of uh, progression uh, on the MRI. The uh, first trial, just like that autolytic trial I told you about, the first one, we have to make sure that this is not toxic, that this is not going to hurt patients more than it has potential to help. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's a dose escalation trial, meaning we start with a certain dose of virus and then we start going up from there. Uh, there are three centers involved, the clinic, uh, UCLA and UCSF. Uh, we have six patients treated to date. Three have been fully evaluated in terms of the toxicity. Uh, and so far, it's been very well tolerated, both the virus and the 5-FC. Uh, we've had no dose-limiting toxicities, uh, and, um, and there's been some suggestions of drug activity, although, again, I, I caution you not to read too much into that. Uh, and uh, we've just scheduled our, our, our teleconference to go over the uh, latest three patients uh, and uh, before we, we open up the next cohort, which is going to be the highest dose uh, that we're going to look at. So that's where that stands right now. Uh, assuming that we get to that highest dose, get through the highest dose fine, uh, and show that that, that is still safe, uh, it's then going to open up and become a con more conventional efficacy trial, looking to see how, how patients actually do with this. And then there's a lot of work to be done here to try to figure out how best to use it uh, and, uh, and, and so many different variables we need to learn. Again, this is, this is very early uh, in the development of that therapeutic. All right, so the, the last new one I'm going to talk about is the tumor treating fields uh, uh, developed by a company called Novacure. Now, most of what I've talked about so far has been developed in a very conventional way. 
uh, and that is starting with, with some very basic research in the laboratory, understanding the mechanism by which the treatment works, um, understanding uh, uh, and, and developing it sequentially through, through laboratory models and animal models and then early stage clinical trials. This one sort of breaks the mold a bit. Um, it is one that we don't fully understand and yet it's already in clinical trial. And it's there because there are some hints that it may actually work. And so, so it's, it's a little bit backwards in that, in that the clinical trials have been going on for a while and now the company and investigators uh, actually around the world are trying to figure out exactly how it works. So I'm gonna tell you what we know about it. And again, this, this program is led by, by my partner, Gene Barnett. So the idea is that we can create fields, electrical fields uh, and, and magnetic fields within the, the, the brain uh, and disrupt certain cellular processes with these fields. Um, and, uh, uh, and so I'm not gonna go into the physics here because you know, not only do, do I not know all the physics, I don't think anybody really understands what's going on here fully, but there's some very nice thoughts about how, how this works. And um, there are two mechanisms. And actually, what I'm gonna do is show this video, which does a much better job than I could do of discussing this. Charges and dipoles oscillate in sync with an alternating electric field. <laughs> At higher frequencies, movement diminishes while dipoles align with the direction of the electric field. In a converging, non-uniform electric field, charges and dipoles move towards high field density. Within a non-dividing cell, the field is uniform, parallel lines of force. At the beginning of mitosis, the microtubule spindle begins to form by polymerization of the highly polar tubulin subunits. In the presence of TT fields, polymerization is disrupted due to alignment of the subunits with the field, leading to arrest of mitosis. In cells which did complete the formation of the mitotic spindle, the cell begins to divide into two cells. The hourglass shape which forms during division results in a non-uniform field distribution which pushes all polar cell components towards the neck between the cells, causing structural disruption and cell fragmentation. So that's the theory. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's a very interesting one, and actually can be, uh, I've, I've seen it, you know, uh, examples in the dish where, where it can be replicated, where you can actually see the cells uh, burst in the fields. <clears throat> the, the, the point of it, though, is that the, the cells have to be aligned in a certain way. And remember, the, the, the most actively dividing cells uh, in someone who has a brain tumor are the brain tumor cells, not the normal brain cells. So that's the idea. And so they have to be aligned in the field in order to have that effect. If they're out of alignment, it has no effect. And of course, cells are gonna be randomly distributed in, in all different alignments. So how do you account for that? Well, the way that th this is performed is the fields move around on the head. So they, they go in different directions. So the electrodes are applied to the head and then the fields just automatically move in different directions to try to capture as many of the cells in the correct orientation as possible. And this is a device that's, that's worn around uh, uh, with this pack. The, 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 uh, this, is, this is the actual energy source uh, and computer. The electrodes are on the scalp. And the device is actually on for 20 to 24 hours a day. Uh, and at least 20 is, is the goal. Uh, with the electrodes actually being on all the time, being, being applied and changed every three to four days. So these are non-invasive electrodes that are applied to the scalp uh, and um, they, they create these fields and uh, the fields are, 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 are moved around. Uh, and so the patient's receiving treatment all the time that the, the source is on and, and the, the goal is to have it at least 20 hours. 
Um, uh, of course, uh, the scalp has to be shaved in order to do this. Um, and, uh, and this is done on a regular basis and the, and the electrodes are reapplied. So uh, the first clinical trial was done in patients uh, with either recurrent disease or newly diagnosed disease uh, and included all the conventional sort of, sort of uh, thing, uh, things that we include in these trials. And uh, again, you have to interpret these curves very, very carefully because this is a, a mix of patients uh, and uh, very, very small number and very highly selected patients. But these show the survival curves. Remember, it's the percentage of people still alive at these time points uh, down here. And then in this trial, the patients that were in this first trial were up here. So it seemed that it was an effective therapy, at least in the patients uh, who were in this trial, which is a relatively small number. Um, uh, so, so this was, of course, the idea of what I said earlier, and that is something that looked very promising, but then going backwards to try to figure out how it was actually uh, working. Um, so uh, a larger trial, a phase three recurrent GBM trial, uh, was presented recently, um, and uh, um, uh, this was a more conventional randomized trial uh, with, with uh, just patients with recurrent GBM, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and it was compared to conventional uh, medical therapy uh, in this setting. Um, Ultimately, in terms of survival, it didn't show a difference. On the other hand, uh, it, there were some hints of, of some increased responses uh, and the like. So it didn't show a, a complete difference to conventional medical therapy. But on the other hand, it didn't have the side effects associated with conventional medical therapy. Uh, because there was no chemotherapy involved here, it did not have um, the kinds of uh, impact, uh, impacts that we see on, on um, overall level of, of energy, overall alertness, um, and uh, functioning, in, you know, uh, on a daily basis, uh, as well as uh, none of the issues with fatigue and nausea, vomiting, and pain, and so on. Um, it was very well tolerated. So the tumor treating fields in that setting appeared to be perhaps as effective as chemotherapies that are used in, the, in that, that situation, but clearly without the toxicities. Uh, that are associated with chemotherapy. So where is it now? Well, because this is a device, and, and I'm not going to go into the, into the subtleties of device approval as opposed to drug approval. With drug approvals, you have to show clear-cut efficacy. With device approval, it's more of a safety question and some hint that it's, that it's uh, acting in the way that it was designed. Uh, so it was cleared as a device. Uh, and um, according to the FDA clearance statement, this is for adults with uh, uh, recurrent GBM uh, used alone as an alternative to standard medical therapy uh, after surgery and radiation has been exhausted as, as, uh, as those options have been exhausted. Okay, so that's the formal language. Of course, um, the, 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 um, there's a lot more, again, to learn with this, this approach. So um, the company, much to its credit, is doing a trial. Uh, so so um, there have been companies in the past who would get that sort of clearance from the FDA and uh, start uh, getting physicians to start using whatever drug or device it was for anything. Uh, here, uh, they're actually doing the trial, and they're, and they're, and they're uh, doing it newly diagnosed GBM. Uh, and, and this is, again, patients who have had surgery or biopsy uh, followed by radiation and chemotherapy. Uh, who then uh, go on to treatment with this or, or uh, Temidar alone. Uh, and um, uh, patients, uh, the way it's randomized, there's two-thirds of a chance go of going on to the TTF field, uh, side and one-third of entering the uh, control group. Uh, and uh, those that are in the TTF group will be treated continuously for up to two years. Uh, and uh, and the, the end point is going to be survival. So we'll, we'll actually learn something uh, from this in terms of whether or not this is truly an effective therapy. Uh, this is going to be uh, a fairly large trial with 283 patients. Uh, and as usual, the trial sponsor pays for all the costs that are not standard of care uh, for this disease. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, so, so, uh, and they have a great support mechanism actually for maintaining and replacing the, the electrodes. So in conclusion, unfortunately, the diseases we're talking about today are still, are still fatal diseases. 
Um, uh, and, uh, and survival depends mostly on the things that we've known for a long time. But we do have a lot of new tools that help us to use what we have uh, uh, available already to make them uh, more effective. Uh, and medical therapies are providing more benefit than ever before. But, but cures are elusive, and, and ultimately it's going to be new therapies, new technologies that, that pave the way to the future. Uh, and hopefully, uh, we, you know, next time I talk to you, it can be about uh, cures. Um, so I, I put this in uh, for, my, for my son's benefit. My son, uh, who's, who's 11, um, has already decided he's going to be an inventor. He's been somewhat inspired by the work I've been doing with the catheters, uh, wants to be an inventor, wants to come up with a robot that's going to cure brain tumors. Uh, so I put this in for his benefit. Uh, this is how he sees himself first going to the OR, running, running his robot. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if we have... I'd uh, be happy to take questions. Uh, with a white sweater? Dr. Vogelbaum, you were talking about uh, earlier in the first couple of pictures, there were the, the necrotic cells that occur from, I forget what it was that they were doing. Um, that was the autolit. Okay. What, is there any danger of the necrotic cells still staying in the brain? No, that, that, that actually, you could see over time, that area where the tumor cells died was, was shrinking. Okay. The brain actually has effective mechanisms. All the treatments we use create necrosis. Okay. Okay. Um, it's not something you hear about a lot. We don't really say, oh, yeah, we're going to give you radiation therapy to try to create necrosis there. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately, um, they, they do at, at some level. Okay. What you don't want is there are forms of necrosis that can get out of control and start creating a lot of swelling and, and, and like that's what we try to avoid. But uh, to some degree, necrosis is the goal here to, 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 to cause death of the tumor okay. cells. Okay. Thank you. Not as fast as I used to be. <laughs> Hi, Matthew Zachary. Um, quick question. Uh, is there any data on the five um, human trials for the viral therapy? On, on, oh, on the, the... You said there were five human, five patients. Six, six patients. Six patients with Six the, patients, but not, not, not uh, no, no efficacy data yet. It's, it's, okay. it's, a, it's a survival, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a um, safety trial uh, at this point. Um, when we've sort of finished the safety component of it, of course, we are following all the patients. We'll see how they're doing, and we'll be able to report on that as well. But it's, it's far too early uh, to be able to make any reasonable assessments. And even then, when you talk about nine patients, you know, that will be in the initial safety group, it, it, you can't really interpret that in terms of predicting whether or not that's going to be, you know, a, a measure of, of survival for all the other patients that will be treated in the future. It's too small, too small of a number to really know. Any more questions? One up front here. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, Gary Schwab. I just um, <clears throat> had a question also about that auto lit. That is, I assume, for tumors that cannot be surgically removed? So that was the first idea behind it. Um, and uh, that's the starting point. Okay. Now, it may be useful in other situations as well. Um, one of the, the things that, that Gene Barnett has been doing with this is treating patients who have had the type of necrosis that's a little out of control, what's called radiation necrosis. And he's seen some um, remarkable effects with that. Is it enough to say that this is a treatment for that? Not yet. But, but he's been very encouraged by that. I've also talked to them about some other ways that that might be used uh, to uh, actually affect the blood-brain barrier. Uh, that's, that's at least in, in the laboratory, there's some evidence that heat can affect blood-brain barrier integrity and maybe that's a good way to get drugs in as well. Mm -hmm. So the, these, there are a number, th this is really just a starting point for that technology. Okay, because I was wondering about what happens to the invasive 
cells. You're only treating with that case the primary tumor. Right. So, so, so uh, there is no one tool that's going to uh, be effective for every aspect of this disease. It's too complex of a disease. Um, will it be useful for the invasive cells? Uh, I'm, I'm putting my own time elsewhere, which is on drug delivery. I, to me, that's, that's, that's more promising for that particular part of the disease. Sir, could you go back to the Novocure uh, phase three slide, the, the data showing the survivals, the, the randomized phase two, if you could go back. I have some questions about that. Uh, fortunately, it took me to the beginning. <laughs> so this one. Um, yeah, the data, the result. So there's just this. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So uh, first question is, are the novel TTF group patient allowed to go back to avastin upon progression in this study? Uh, in general, yes. Um, where this study was done, there was not a lot of access to avastin. So if the question is, did, did a number of these patients receive Avastin, I don't have those data on hand to tell you how many, what, what percent on either arm received it, but I know it was performed in countries where Avastin was not readily available. I see. So the second question is, we know the phase two data for Avastin for recurring patients usually uh, have a median survival of about nine months. Uh, so would you, would you think Novocore would be comparable to Avastin? You, you can't do that comparison, okay? And, and the, 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 the reason is that there are two very different trials, two different study populations. Um, one group of recurrent GBM is not the same as another. Uh, in fact, and, and they're small trials. And this is the danger of looking at small trials and trying to make interpretations between them uh, and why we have fa the large trials, you know, the many hundreds of patients' trials. Those, ultimately, these trials are predictions. They're making predictions. What they're trying to do is say, we have this group of patients, and they're going to represent what's going to happen when we give it to 100,000 patients or a million patients. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the way a trial is set up is, is in a way that, that gives it a certain amount of power to make that prediction. Small phase two trials don't have the power to effectively make the prediction for 100,000 people, which is why ultimately you need to do large phase three trials to compare directly those things in question. So if you wanted to ask the question, is the TTF as effective as Avastin, you need to put that into a large trial to compare them directly. To compare two separate trials can be very perilous. Okay, thank you. A okay. uh, question about the TOCO 511. Did you say that the next uh, cohort that opens up is the largest dose? It's the highest dose. Or the highest dose. And are there any more after that, after to, to complete the phase one trial? Uh, that should be, so, so I, I think we're gonna have a, a bit of an expansion of that one just to confirm that's the highest dose, but then the plan is to move into a phase two. Okay, and then how many patients roughly per cohort? So for, for any safety trials, usually three valuable, three valuable patients. And that's so. across all the centers or is that per center that's all? No, no, that's across all the centers. Wow, okay. Yeah, so, but, but you know, um, so without going into all the details, why it's actually hard to find patients for this because it's very, very restrictive in terms of the entry criteria. At some point, it's going to have to we're going to have to loosen that up, or they're going to have to open a lot of centers, which is, creates its own logistical issues. Um, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's actually somewhat hard to find the, the, the right patients for this, which again goes back to the point I was making earlier. These are very, very highly selected patients. So if you want to you know, consider efficacy here, well, the, these are essentially going to be the ones who one would normally predict are going to live the longest. So it's going to look good. 
you know, ultimately it has to be, it has to be uh, compared in a way that, that, you know, we really understand how effective it's going to be for everyone, not, not just for those few. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I just had a, a follow-up after you talked about highly selective patients. Are they doing gene testing on these patients before they go into these tests to see if they have the right gene makeup that would give them a higher survival? No. Not, no. not that gene testing. There's other things, but not that. Uh, there are other things just because of uh, exposure to the virus. That, okay. But that's, that's no, not, not uh, you know, to, uh, so, so those, those, those um, predictive arrays um, are useful for right now for looking at populations of patients. Um, for individual patients, it's not yet been validated. There, there's some data that will be coming out to start validating that, but, but it's, it's, um, they're still not there in terms of saying, you know, uh, a patient should be in one trial versus another trial. In fact, you know, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, this stuff doesn't move fast enough, as, as I'm sure everyone in here understands. Uh, and uh, in terms of understanding whether or not these, these predictive markers are very useful in separating patients out, um, I, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with the 1P19Q story, okay, um, for what have been called in the past anaplastic oligodendrogliomas, but now we're sort of thinking of these tumors in terms of their 1P19Q genetics. That's a story that's been around since the mid-90s, and we are now conducting the definitive trials, showing that you can actually make predictions and alter therapy based upon that. So it, it does take a while. Now, that happens to be in, in a tumor that is a much, much lower incidence than GBM, so it's much harder to do the trials. For GBM, things move faster. So, so um, we'll be, we're, we, we've already been doing trials to validate some of the predictive markers, and some of those data are going to be coming out soon. Okay. I have a question about the TOCA 511. Is that potentially useful for killing the invasive cells, or is it more, is it hard for it to spread out into invasive cells and more for focal right. tumor? So I alluded to that, and right now it's, it's being um, directed towards the focal tumor because there is no... Uh, accepted method, accepted device for doing CED, for doing the spread, okay? Um, so Tokogen is based in San Diego. Um, they're, they, they're running the trial at UCLA and UCSF, which makes sense geographically, and then there's Cleveland. Why Cleveland? And the, and the reason is they're very interested in, in some of the technology I'm developing and, and, and for developing, for spreading it out further in the tumor. Um, and, and that's why. I mean, it's, it's, uh, they recognize that as well. And, and I think most everybody understands that, that if we're going to talk about cure, we've got to get to every cell, not just the bulk. Okay. I, have a quick I have a quick presentation, and we have to wrap this up. We're running over time. I'd like to uh, award this $60,000 grant for a brain tumor project. Could you just explain sure. briefly? What uh, the project so the so this this project um, I also I also run a laboratory and and uh, one of the areas that I find very fascinating is immunotherapy and you're going to hear uh, a lot about immunotherapy later on from from a real expert Dr. Okada uh, who's going to talk about the work he's been doing we've also been doing some work on immunotherapy we have uh, a new type of immune cell um, called an MDSC which seems to suppress it does suppress the immune system, and what we found is that the MDSCs are higher. We see more of those in the, in the, in the bloodstream of patients with GBM than with any other cancer. Uh, and so we're uh, been working on characterizing those cells, how they work, how they cause immune suppression, and, and with the goal of developing strategies to overcome their immunosuppressive effect and try to get the immune system to work better against the tumor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vogelbaum. That was fantastic.